Hey there, Calc2 folks, back here with a, another video lecture in our study of Chapter 12 material uh, where we are going to focus in on uh, some ideas that are going to help us to understand the shape of uh, the surfaces that we're going to encounter in three-dimensional space when we sort of wrap up our semester and we look at the quadratic surfaces here in Chapter 13 as well as uh, move forward into the um, Calculus 3 material, if you're going to continue on into Calc 3, where we are looking at multivariable functions. Those multivariable functions are going to form surfaces. And to help us understand these surfaces, um, we're going to take their cross-sections. And what we will see in a, a lot of the surfaces, or at least in what we call the uh, quadratic surfaces that we encounter, uh, their cross-sections are going to form what we call, or a lot of their cross-sections are going to form what we call conic sections, right? Uh, so what we're going to do here today is, is spend some time looking at the conic sections, and particularly we're going to focus our attention on the, the last three of the conic sections, what we call parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbola, right? Um, the... What we do note here is the, the, the conic sections do come about when we intersect a cone or what we call a double cone with a plane. When a cone or a double cone is inter intersected with a plane, the cross section that is formed is what's known as a conic section. And there are uh, several conic sections that are on the list th that form what we call these fundamental shapes known as the conic sections. And those are uh, the point, the line, the circle, the parabola, the ellipse, and the hyperbola. Where we might consider the first three, if not four of these, are topics that we're already kind of familiar with in terms of understanding these shapes algebraically in the plane. All right? Um, but we will come back to parabolas and incorporate that into a bit of a study on ellipses and hyperbola. Now, all of these fundamental shapes form again when we intersect a, a cone or what we call a double cone. You'll notice this illustration illustrates a cone, whereas this illustration is illustrating what we know as that double cone, that cone uh, that is placed along with its inverted cone, uh, placed tip to tip with one another, all right? Uh, depending on how we slice either this cone or this double cone, we will get these different resulting cross-sections known as the conic sections. For example, and, and we don't really see these first two in the illustrations here. That's why I did uh, kind of highlight these with a bit of a note within inside the parentheses here. Uh, if we were to intersect a cone or this double cone right at the tip, right, right at the very point of the cone, that plane, when it intersects the very point of that cone, is just going to form a point in the plane. All right, that's all the cross section is going to be there. That is when the plane makes an intersection at the tip. Whereas if the plane was to just intersect the cone along one of these lateral edges, you'll notice here what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sketching along with my arrow is what would be that lateral edge of this cone. If the plane was just to come through at the cone and just be, uh, what, just barely touch the cone right along this lateral edge, right? Uh, if we were to say it was tangent to the cone here along this lateral edge, uh, it would form what we just call a line in space, right? That would just be a resulting line in space. And we can see we could have that line form here on this edge of this cone, or maybe it forms here uh, along this edge of the double cone. Right? If a plane was just to cross through right there along that edge, it would form what we call just a line in that plane. Well, we're pretty familiar with points, we're pretty familiar with lines, and in fact, we're also very familiar with circles and parabolas. Uh, but let's take note that a circle does occur. We can see the circle being illustrated here with some perspective in the drawing. When that plane actually intersects the, 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 the lateral edge of the cone at a bit of a... Uh, a right angle to what we might call the, the, the axis of revolution in the cone. 
when that plane intersects at that particular angle, a circle will form, right, as that shape of that cross section. Whereas if we were to put that plane at a bit more of an angle, when it intersects the cone, it would actually form what we call an ellipse in that space. And if we were to dip that angle far enough for that intersecting plane, so that it intersects both the base and the lateral edge, we could have a couple of resulting shapes. If it intersects at a steep enough angle, it will form what we call the shape of a parabola in that space. And if it intersects at, I believe, uh, you know, this illustration is a little off here. What we might think of is this, this uh, hyperbola's illustration actually meeting the base of the cone at a bit of a right angle, more like what we see over here in the double cones illustration. If that plane was to intersect the two bases of this double cone at a right angle, right, uh, passing through the edges of the cone, it would form these the, this shape known as a hyperbola. Now this illustration is a little off with that hyperbola. There's usually some gap between the two curves in a hyperbola. Um, and this is what we call a hyperbola of two sheets that forms in with two cones, or we might just have the case for a hyperbola of one sheet if we're considering the conic section with just one cone. Right, uh, And depending on how that plane intersects, we will have one of these descriptions of the cross-section. Again, we're awful familiar with the first five. What we're going to do is come back and formalize the last three right, uh, in the context of conic sections. And the reason we don't throw the circle in there, folks, is we are already kind of familiar with the circle in the context of the cross section or of the conic sections. If you keep in mind for a circle, its equation we should be familiar with might be given by the equation, um, let's go with this one here, x minus, eh, it's not a ratio, let me get rid of that. It's x minus h quantity squared, uh, quantity squared, plus the quantity y minus k quantity squared equal to r squared, right? We are already familiar with the conic section of the circle in the context of we are already really familiar with this equation, right? We understand this represents a circle in the xy plane centered at the coordinate h comma k and with a radius measurement of r, all right? Uh, this has been a study of ours or been part of our study of algebra since the days of, well, I should say uh, college algebra, right? Where we're going to now, and, and well, I should say, so has been the parabola, but we're going to formalize this, what we say is in the context of the conic sections, along with the ellipse and the hyperbolas in this section, right? So where I do begin is with the case for a hyperbola, right? Uh, let me scroll down. I forgot to scroll through these and space these out, so we'll do the best we can here. Um, so starting here with the case for a parabola, um, what you will see is when we define these within the context of the conic sections, uh, we do present what we call an algebraic, or well, I should say a geometrical understanding of this uh, shape in the space of this conic section, uh, where for a parabola, this is a little different than what we have uh, seen as their def definition in the past. Typically, we've defined them through the quadratic function. Uh, here, we're going to define them actually as a particular shape with uh, some property to it, right? And in the case of a parabola, it is defined as the shape in the plane, right, that forms what we say between a point known as the focus and a line that we call the directrix, right? Where the parabola are these points, right, that are in this plane and equal distance, or what we say is equidistance, right, from both the focus of the parabola and what we call the directrix of that parabola. Uh, and this equidistant behavior is happening simultaneously between these points, all right? Now that may seem a little obscure until I get a visualization 
of a parabola up here. So I, I will note as I do have some uh, visualizations in the notes to come, so bear with me. We'll maybe perhaps come back to this definition just to, to, to check our understanding of it here when we get a visualization into play. But let me take note, and you may have seen this note already. Um, let's first note that in terms of parabolas, there are two common orientations. Now I can see here I didn't do a spell check. Let me do this real quick. All right. I'm back. Made those quick spelling errors before I spend a whole time lecturing on something that has a full of spelling errors. Uh, again, as noted, with in terms of parabolas, there are two common orientations for a parabola in the plane, uh, which allow us to define the parabola within the context of the plane's dimensions. Right? And these are the cases for what we call vertical parabolas and horizontal parabolas. Right? Where we begin is with the more classical parabolic shape that we're familiar with that comes from the quadratic function, and that is the case for vertical parabolas. Right? For a parabola in the xy plane, with its vertex at the origin, now what is the vertex of a parabola? That is the peak or the valley of the parabola. It's the highest or lowest point in the graph of the parabola when looking at it orientated vertically. Right? That focus, right? is going to be at the coordinate 0 comma p. The directrix will be described by the line y equals negative p. And this parabola will be orientated vertically in this xy plane, such that if this is the description of the focus and this is the description of the directrix, and the vertex is at the origin, the equation of that parabola is given by this equation here. It's given by the form y equals 1 over 4p times the quantity x squared. All right? This becomes known as the equation for a vertically orientated parabola whose vertex is at the origin. All right? This equation does highlight within it this value of p, right? which is used to understand where the focus is located in this parabola, as well as that line known as the directrix. All right. If we go a little further and take note on this value of p, if that focus is some pl place located bigger than zero along the y-axis, we say that that parabola opens upward, whereas if that value that highlights the location of the focus is less than zero along the y-axis, the parabola is going to certainly open downward. If we note the following illustration for this case, this is what we can illustrate as a parabola described by this equation above. As we said, this equation describes a parabola where in the xy plane, that parabola is, is orientated vertically, and what we mean by that is it opens either up or it opens down with its vertex here at the origin. And what we can see is this parabola is orientated with its vertex down here at the origin. And when this is the case that it's described by this equation with this orientation, this value of p is going to highlight the location of the vertex. That location, or sorry, not the vertex, the focus. With that location of the fo focus happening here along the y-axis at this location 0, comma p. And if this is the location of the focus, on the other side of the parabola, down here where y equals the opposite of p, given by this line y equals negative p, we have this line in our graph known as the directrix. Both the focus and the directrix are not part of our parabola's graph, but what they help to do is define our parabola's graph. As we had noted back in our definition, what is a parabola? Well, it's all the points right, that are in this plane that are equal distance from both the focus and the directrix at the exact same time. What we will notice in this illustration is that every single point in this plane, and I did draw this within scale, and I did draw this, you know, with a, you know, 
some accuracy involved here, right, with some very high level of precision, what we notice is, is if we put ourselves at some point on that parabola, and that really is what this point is highlighting out here, is just some location on our parabola, and we consider the distance from this location back to the focus, and we consider the distance from this location back to the directrix, that distance meeting the directrix at a right angle. That distance to the directrix and then that distance to the focus are the same at every single location along this parabola. I've just drawn that being true here for this one location. By putting this point here, you can visually see that this length seen here is quite similar in size to this length seen here. If you were to get out a ruler and perhaps measure these on your screen, uh, you would see that that would be true. And not only is it true here at this point, it would be true up here at this point, it would be true down here at this point, that would be true over here on the left side of our parabola at any of these points. One other point we can easily see that being true here is at the vertex. Here at the vertex, that is a point on our parabola, and note its distance to the focus and its distance to the directrix. Both of these distances, up and down, to the focus and the directrix are equal in length. That is true at every single point on that parabola. That's what defines it. All right? Now, this again is a case where we have a foci that happens to lie on the y-axis, a directrix described by the line y equals the opposite of the foci's location, and the parabola being uh, located with such that its vertex is at the origin. All right? An equation that looks like this will describe a parabola that looks like this in its orientation. Right? Whether it opens up or whether it opens down in this orientation will depend upon the value of P right? in the calculation where the actual focus is located. All right? Now, all right? Uh, the other orientation we have for a parabola is one that's orientated horizontally in the plane. Right? If we have a parabola orientated horizontally in the plane with its vertex at the origin <coughs> and its focus located at the coordinate P comma zero, some location along the x-axis, the directrix will be described by the line on the other side of the y-axis where x equals negative P and this all will be orientated horizontally where that parabola as described above will be given by this equation x equals 1 over 4p times y squared. Notice both of these equations look very similar. What changes in both of these equations is really the, lo the, the location of x and y in the equation. Here we are making y dependent upon the value of x to orientate ourselves vertically, whereas if we were presented with an equation in a very similar looking format, but where x was being illustrated as, can I get this to center up here? Apparently not, let's, right there. Whereas if I was to make my relationship such that x was dependent upon y in a very similar looking equation style, we would have a parabola that orientates itself horizontally. Now, as I noted, this does describe a parabola that orientates itself horizontally where dependent upon the value of p, depending upon where our focus is located along this x-axis, the parabola is either gonna open up to the right or open to the left, right? If P is greater than zero, the focus will be on the right side of the x-axis, and it will then open to the right, whereas if that P is less than zero, the, the focus will be on the left side of the x-axis, and that parabola will open to the left. And what we see in this illustration down below here is the case where P is greater than zero, right? In the case of P being greater than zero and this equation being well, an equation for the parabola being given here in this form, or in an equation that can be expressed in this form, uh, 
Um, we do see that this would describe a parabola that would look like this one that's orientated horizontally in this space. As noted, this is a parabola that orientates itself horizontally with its vertex at the origin, which this parabola does illustrate, and has a focus located at the coordinate p comma zero and a directrix described by the line x equal to negative p. And what forms this parabola in space is all the points in this xy plane, every one of these points in the xy plane, where their distance to the focus and the directrix are the same, right, for any given point. We note at this point, if we observe the distance back to the focus and the distance from it over to the directrix, right, both of those distances are the same in value. And, and the illustration does appear to show us that they are equal. That, again, can also be seen rather easily right here at the vertex. At the vertex, the distance to the focus and the distance over to the left to the directrix are both the same. That is true for every single point on this parabola. All right? That's what helps us to define a parabola in space. A parabola in space is all the points in a space, in a, a two-dimensional space, that are the same distance from a point, known as the parabola's focus, and a line known as the parabola's directrix. Right? If I want to think of um, sketching a parabola in space or constructing a parabola in space, all I need is a point in that space and a line in that space. If I have a point and I have a line, I can make a parabola. I just need to figure out what are all the points that are the same distance from both that point and that line. When I obtain those points, I will have my description of a parabola. And if that parabola orientates itself in space, as we've seen here either in this illustration or seen here in this illustration, right, we will have one of the two respective algebraic equations describe that parabola. Right? If we consider an example, right? I say consider this example down here. Right? Consider the parabolic equation expressed as follows. Now one thing you're going to note is that they're not always going to be explicitly expressed as they, they're seen in definition. In this case, this certainly doesn't explicitly look like either of the two forms given above. Other than, what's a big clue here, is that one of my variables is to the first power and the other is to the second, right? That is some of the clue that hints to the fact that what we might have here is a parabolic equation. And if we go above and, and note what specific case we probably have, well, out of the two cases, right, which case involves an x to the first power and a y to the second power, well, that's not this case, right? That is not the case of a vertically orientated parabola. That is actually this case down here seen for the horizontally orientated case. Where if I want to start to begin understanding that horizontally related case, I might want to rewrite it so that x, that single value of x, is uh, the dependent value and make it dependent on the value of y. And you can do that in this equation by subtracting 100y squared from both sides and dividing by 20. All right? If I subtract 100x, 100y squared from both sides and I divide by 20, all right, I can actually express this equation explicitly in this form, x equals 1 over 4py squared, as this equation here. x equals negative 5 times y squared, where this negative 5 is now playing the role of 1 over 4p, right? Where 1 over 4p is equal to negative 5. And with a little bit of algebra here, particularly, uh, I can do what, some cross multiplication here. I could find that p must be equal to then what we say is negative 1 20th in value. All right? So what does that tell me about this parabola scene here. Well, first of all, because P is negative, 
and the form is the form x equals 1 over 4py squared, this must be a parabola that opens to the left with its vertex at the origin. As for the focus, that will be located on the x-axis at the coordinate negative 1 20th comma 0, and the directrix would be given by the line x equal to 1 20th. And if I put all that information together in an illustration of the parabola, this is the illustration down below for this equation. All right? This would be the parabola drawn to precision all right? in the xy plane given by this equation that does illustrate a parabola opening to the left with its vertex here at the origin and a focus located at negative 1 20th, where if you note that in decimal form, that is negative 0.05, and a directrix given by the equation x equal to positive 1 20th, which would be this vertical line passing through space here, crossing the x-axis at 1 20th, which is again 0.05. What forms this parabola then is every single point in the space that is the same distance from this focus and this directrix. And you can see that that property would appear to hold in this case, right? Um, I would be cautious here with trying to see that property. It is a, probably a little out of scale on the y-axis. Uh, if this is from 0 to point 0.1, point 0.1 is actually way out here. So take note that one property there is going to be not necessarily uh, bestly illustrated, except perhaps perhaps at the uh, x-axis itself, right? When we move out in north and south along the y-axis, things are not quite, well, yeah, things are not quite in scale. One unit, or point one unit along the y-axis is this long, point one unit along the x-axis is this long. So things are a little out of scale. Take note. Right? And you're not always going to be able to obtain that scale in your illustrations, but what you are going to be able to do is to denote these key locations from this description right? so that you have a thorough description of your parabola, even though you may not be able to sketch it with 100% precision. All right? So often in the sketch, you'll be asked to locate these what? Uh, these properties of the parabola. All right, take note. Now, that is the case for a parabola. We do follow this up with the case for a ellipse. All right. Now, in the case of an ellipse, all right, uh, by definition, all right, uh, we say an ellipse is defined in the plane around two foci, right? Where the points on the ellipse have what we say is a constant sum for the distances from a point on the ellipse to each focus, right? Now, that definition might be a little obscure at the moment. Um, as I have noted in the case of the parabola, I am going to try to illustrate that with some visualization here. But let me go ahead and bring up into note first um, a specific case of an ellipse and then we will see this definition in the description in a, just a moment in, with, a, with a, a visualization right but as with parabolas again there are two common orientations for an ellipse in the xy plane right the case for vertical and the case for a horizontal orientation right um, we start off again with vertical, right, just to keep some consistency here. And we might say, it, in the case of a vertical ellipse, an ellipse in the xy plane with its center at the origin and foci at the coordinates 0, comma, plus or minus c has major vertices at the location 0, comma, plus or minus b and minor vertices at the location plus or minus a, comma, 0 and is given by the equation x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal to 1. Where in this equation, what you will see uniquely is that b squared will be greater than the value of a squared. 
right? And what you will not notice in this equation is that it does not give us a description for C. It only describes the location of what we call these major and minor vertices, right? With the values of A and B in the form. As for where the foci are located, we have to determine that by using this formula for C squared. In this relationship between A, B, and C, inside an ellipse, C squared will always be equal to B squared minus A squared. All right, we're gonna have to use this relationship in a formal description of ellipse to figure out where the foci are located, but that formal description will tell us where our vertices are located. And what makes one set of vertices what we call a major set and what calls, allows us to call the other a minor set is what set of vertices falls on the same axis as our foci, right? Because our foci and the vertices 0, comma, plus or minus b occur on the same axes here, that makes the vertices 0, comma, plus or minus b our major vertices. Right? Now, what do I mean by all this in an illustration? Uh, that was a rather quick jump, but this is the illustration of that parabola's, or sorry, ellipse's description given above, right? What we are describing here is this shape, right? Uh, the shape that we, we know as the shape for an ellipse, right? Where what's unique about this ellipse, right? First of all, is that it is centered at the origin, right? It is forming around these two foci, one of them at zero comma C, the other at zero comma negative C, and it has vertices, major vertices at zero comma B, zero comma negative B. Those vertices could be called major because they fall on the same axis as the foci. And it has minor vertices here along the x-axis at plus or minus A comma zero. All right. These are called the minor vertices because they do not fall on the same axis as the foci. Right? And what you will notice happen is, is if b squared is greater than a squared in this orientation, certainly these distances from the origin out to the vertices are going to be different. And the distance out to, to the major vertices will always be longer from the origin than the distance out from the origin to the minor vertices. In a sense, the we might call this a major diameter, will always be larger than the minor diameter in an ellipse. All right? And how those foci relate to those values of A, B, and C is through this relationship here. C squared is always equal to B squared minus A squared. All right? That gives us this understanding for an ellipse. Now, what do we mean by definition? Again, we go back to our definition and tie that into this illustration also. Uh, an ellipse is going to be all the points in the plane whose distances from the point to each focus has a constant sum. Right? If we notice, if I put here, I've put a couple of different locations on this ellipse to help highlight this idea. If I'm at a different location on the ellipse, there, or as I should say, as I change location on this ellipse, the distance back to the two foci is also gonna change. Notice at this location, this is the distance to the first foci, this is the distance to the other foci, whereas at this point on the ellipse, this is the distance to this foci, this is the distance to the other foci. By changing those locations, those distances to each individual foci do change, right? But what remains constant is the sum of these two distances. If I take this very short distance and I add it to this very long distance for this point, the sum of those two distances will be equal to the sum of these two distances, right? If I take the distance from this point on the ellipse to this foci and the distance from this point on the ellipse to this foci, if I add up those two distances, they will give me the exact same sum as adding the short distance and this long distance to each other. This is true for any single point on the ellipse, right? At this point here, 
the distance from here to here added to the distance from here to here will be the sum or the same as the sum of these two different distances or the same as the sum of these two distances. Or if I was at this point over here at the minor vertices and was to consider the distance to these two foci and add those up, that sum would be the same as the sum of these two distances or these two distances. Right? That's what we use to define an ellipse in the plane. All I need in a plane is two foci. Right? With two foci placed in the plane, if I can identify every single point in the plane then that has a sum of the distances back to these two foci that are equal, then that shape that that will form is known as an ellipse. Right? Now, in the case for a horizontal orientation to an ellipse, right, we do see a similar description of behavior, right, where an ellipse in the xy plane centered at the o o origin and has foci given at the locations plus or minus c comma zero has major vertices at plus or minus a comma zero, minor vertices at the location zero comma plus or minus b, and is given by the equation x squared plus a squared, or x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared must be equal to the value of one. This will be, you'll notice, a very similar looking equation to the case of a vertically orientated ellipse. In fact, the equation for a vertically orientated ellipse looks a lot like the equation for a horizontally orientated ellipse. They are a little tricky to tell apart until you know exactly what to look for. And what you're looking for is this relationship between these denominators a squared and b squared. In the case for a vertically orientated ellipse, b squared will be greater than a squared. Whereas in the case of a horizontally orientated ellipse, how a squared will compare to b squared will be that a squared is bigger than b squared. If a squared is bigger than b squared, your foci will now occur on your x-axis, your major axes will now, or vertices will now occur on the x-axis, and your minor vertices will be found along the y-axis. Right? Where your major and minor vertices locations will occur uh, will, will be described in the equation with the quantities a squared and b squared. Right? And as for the location of the foci, right, that is not explicitly given in the equation, but is calculated by using this additional formula. You will note that in this case, c squared will be equal to a squared minus the b squared in value. Right? And what this is describing is an ellipse that looks like this seen below. This is what we call a horizontally orientated ellipse. In this ellipse, the what we might think of as the major diameter, the, the diameter that is longer is occurring along the x-axis, whereas the diameter that is shorter is now occurring along the y-axis. That is going to cause these foci to also be placed along the Y, uh, x axis, right? The major vertices will occur at a comma zero and negative a comma zero. The minor vertices will occur at zero comma b and zero comma negative b, and the foci will be located at negative c comma zero, c comma zero, where c squared will be equal to now a squared minus b squared. Again, what is uh, true about this elliptical shape is that if I place myself at any point on the shape and I consider the distance back to the two foci and add up those distances, that some of those distances will be the same for any location on this ellipse. If I was to place myself at this point and consider the sum of these two distances back to the foci, that sum will be equivalent to the sum of these two distances. That'll be true for any point on this ellipse. Or, yeah, on this ellipse. If we look at a specific case of an ellipse, 
right? We might consider the case of the ellipse expressed by the equation 4x squared plus 25y squared equal to 100. Now, again, like the previous example, I take note that we don't always see these equations expressed in their expre uh, explicit format given back in their definition. Now, to obtain the explicit form of this ellipse, right, um, what I note is that if you go back and you look at these equations for the ellipse, they are identical, right, in both the horizontal and the vertical orientations, right? They both are absolutely identical to each other. What separates the vertical case from the horizontal case is actually the relationship between b squared and a squared. These values seen uh, in the denominators below the x squared and the y squared in this explicit format. What is going to help us obtain our explicit format is trying to get the right hand side of this explicit format uh, to, to resemble what we see here and that is explicitly the value of 1. If we go back and look at our example, right? It's not going to take much algebra to make this explicitly the value of 1 on the right-hand side of this equation. All I'm going to have to do is divide both sides of this equation by the value of 100. If I divide 4x squared by 100, I will get x squared over 25. If I divide 25y squared by 100, I will get y squared over 4. And if I divide 100 by 100, I will get the value of 1. So what we note is in this case, right, the equation for the ellipse can be ex expressed explicitly in the form x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal to 1 as the statement x squared over 25 plus y squared over 4 equal to 1. We're, what we now highlight is that a squared is going to be the value of 25 b squared is going to be the value of 4, implying that a is plus or minus 5 and b is plus or minus 2. And the value of c squared would be equal to 21, or that c would equal plus or minus the root 21. And since a squared is bigger than b squared, this is going to be the description for the ellipse centered at the origin with major vertices falling along the x-axis at the values of plus or minus 5 comma 0, given by our value of a, minor vertices falling along the y-axis at 0 comma plus or minus 2, plus or minus 2 being given by the value of b, and foci at the locations given by plus or minus the root of 21. Now the root of 21 is somewhere between 4 and 5 in value, right? I'll take note. And where we found that square root of 21 was by using that relationship that c squared must be equal to a squared minus b squared. All right? Since a squared is greater than b squared in this case, we do have a horizontally orientated ellipse. If we note the illustration of what we described above, this is the illustration of that ellipse. All right? We do note we have major vertices at negative 5 and positive 5 along our x-axis. We do have minor vertices at negative 2 and positive 2 along our y-axis. And the foci in this example do fall at plus or minus the square root of 21 comma 0 at some value between 4 and 5 in value. Minus 4 and 5, negative 5 in value and positive 4 and positive 5 in value. Right? We do see those foci illustrated right here in our illustration. And what is unique about this ellipse is that all the points in this space have the same constant sum of the distances back to these two points known as our foci. Right? And all that came from this equation of the ellipse. Right? All of the xy coordinates that form this ellipse in this space make this equation true algebraically. Right? And you can see that is true. If I took uh, this location right here at 0, 2, 
If I plug in zero there, this will all turn to zero in the first term. If I plug in two here for y, that'll be two squared, which will be four. And four divided by four is one. I will have zero plus one, which does indeed equal one. This is true for every single coordinate on the ellipse. All right, this is the equation describing this shape in this space. All right, and for ellipses, what you notice is that equation is gonna look the same for both the horizontal and the vertical orientation. What you're gonna to have to pay attention to is which term, the x squared term or the y squared term has a larger diam uh, diameter, has, that's part of it, but what has a larger denominator, right? The larger denominator, uh, the term with the larger denominator is gonna indicate what axes uh, the uh, foci will fall upon and what axes will be our major axes, all right? Take note, all right? And then our third case for a conic section and final case here in this study is going to be the case for a hyperbola. All right? Here's my definition for a hyperbola. And I'll go ahead and just leave this all on the screen. Now, in the last case for a hyperbola here, we see, to begin with, a very similar definition to that of an ellipse with a little change in there. Um, a hyperbola is defined in the plane, or again, around two foci here, where the points on the hyperbola don't have a constant sum to the points at the focus, but have a constant difference, right, for the distances from a point on the hyperbola to each focus. Now, this might be coming a little bit more clear to us what we mean by these definitions, but I will hold off on illustrating this with a, a visualization here in just a moment. But as with parabolas and the ellipse, there are two common orientations for a hyperbola in the xy plane. The case for a vertical and the case for a horizontal orientation. And we're gonna start again with the vertical orientation. And a hyperbola in the xy plane, and it sounds like my neighbor's lawn crew is showing up to cut their grass. So I'm gonna pause the video right here for a moment. They're usually pretty quick and I'll be back to finish this up. Pick up where I left off and uh, take note that, again, we are talking hyperbolas and they do occur in the cases, uh, the common cases of a vertical or horizontal orientation. In the case for a vertical orientated hyperbola, it is a, a, a graph that occurs in the xy plane centered at the origin with foci located at the coordinate zero comma plus or minus C and just a set of vertices at the location zero comma plus or minus B. And are given by, right, it's given by this equation y squared over b squared minus x squared over a squared equal to one. Where when we think about the value of c squared, right, the location of the vertices, it's not stated explicitly in this equation. It, it is calculated by noting that b, uh, it's equal to the sum of b squared plus a squared, right? And we also notice up here in the description of this hyperbola, the value of a is not used as a uh, specific location in the graph anywhere. Instead, a is used with b to help define the foci, and A is used with B to help define the end behavior seen in these orientations, in these graphs, right? Uh, in the case of a vertical hyperbola, the ends of the graph, here's a illustration of what we're defining above, the ends of the graph are gonna head off to plus or minus infinity, right, in all directions. The actual value that they approach as they head off to plus or minus infinity in all directions, are described by this set of oblique asymptotes given by the linear equation y equals plus or minus b over a times x. They're given by the equations of these lines that pass through the origin and have a slope given by plus or minus the value of b over the value of a.
all right, times x. That defines these lines. And here's the line y equals positive b over a times x. And here is the line y equals negative b over a times x. Right? This defines right, the vertical hyperbola. Right? Um, the vertical hyperbola of, in general, we usually set it up for a hyperbola in two sheets. Right? Where orientation, how we actually determine orientation here, folks, really is dependent upon this first term. What we notice is this does look a little like the equation for an ellipse, right? Except we are now finding the difference of the two terms on the left-hand side of the equation, where in this case of the vertical hyperbola, the difference is between the term y squared over b squared and x squared over a squared, where y squared over b squared is well, is uh, presented first in that difference, right? When that is the case, this is a hyperbola whose foci and vertices will occur in reference to the y-axis. What we will see in the case for a horizontal is by sh changing the role of these two terms, making x squared over a squared first and y squared over b squared second, we will have the case for a vertical hype all right sorry a horizontal hyperbola right again where we will see some common behavior right with respect to that hyperbola but we'll also then see some changes in terms of where these key locations will occur on the graph right if we scroll down and look at the case for a horizontal hyperbola let me align this and I, horizontal case, right? Uh, again, a hyperbola is gonna form in the xy plane centered at the origin with foci in this case given by the coordinates plus or minus c comma zero and vertices now at the locations plus or minus a comma zero and given by the equation x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equal to the value of one where you can see when compared to the other uh, orientation for a hyperbola, what changes in this equation is the orientation of those terms x squared over a squared and y squared over b squared, right? Here, x squared over a squared happens first in the difference, and you're taking away the quantity y squared over b squared from that value. Again, we don't need this condition, right? This is where c squared is equal to b squared plus a squared. Right? As com composed to how a squared and b squared compared to each other, they can be in any size with respect to one another. Right? There's no condition on their sizes. Right? What defines the horizontal case is, again, what term comes first here in this difference, or how this difference is overall arranged with respect to uh, the x term and the y term. Right? And as seen in the other graph, we will also have some asymptotic behavior defining the ends of these graphs and they are again going to be described by the oblique asymptotes y equal to plus or minus b over a, a times x All right um, you'll notice i think i deviate from the book just a little bit in my defining of these i try to always keep a squared associated with x squared and b squared associated with y squared um, it's, it's one last thing to have to switch around the order of in this understanding, right? So that does keep my asymptotes very specific in this description. This is will be given by y equals plus or minus b over a times x, All right? What this does describe is this orientation, right? This hyperbola is orientated this way with at least, or with at most these two sheets. You may see only half of it at times, which would be defined as a one sheet hyperbola. But here, in general, you define them in, in the context of two sheets, right? A cross section of a double cone, right? Uh, where here, because x squared over a squared comes first in this orientation, we get in this, in this difference, uh, the orientation happens horizontally, where the vertices will again happen at plus or minus the values of a found from a squared, 
All right? The foci will be given by the value, again, c squared equal to b squared plus a squared, or the plus or minus square root of b squared plus a squared. All right? That will help us identify the foci location. And then in terms of how the end behavior forms, it will form between these two oblique asymptotes. Or I really should say the ends of the graph that are heading off to positive or negatives in infinity values are going to be uh, ending very, very close to these oblique asymptotes. Right? Where what helps us to define the oblique asymptotes in this case are those values of B over in it, A. All right? Now, B is not seen in the graph as any sort of specific location. Again, it helps to define the asymptotes and helps to define the location for the foci. But in terms of a vertice, the number that, that falls underneath Y squared here really doesn't have a specific location in this graph right? as a coordinate. Right? So this is the case of a horizontally orientated uh, hyperbola. If we look at a quick example here, uh, we might consider the case of this equation. 64 plus 4x squared equal to 16y squared. Right? That certainly is not expressed explicitly as a hyperbola. and As we've seen, we have to sort of do some rearranging of these at times to get them in an explicit form. And if we rearrange this one, you will notice we are going to try to, again, keep a positive 1 on one side of the equation. In order to keep this and make this a positive 1, I might divide everything by 64 and then subtract what would be x squared over 16 from both sides. That will produce this explicit form that resembles this case stated above. Where if we go back and we note this, this case stated above, because the y squared over 4 is orientated first in this difference, right, is the first term in this difference, that is not this case, but is the case for a vertically orientated hyperbola, right? where that means the value we see underneath the y is our b squared, the value we see underneath the x is our a squared. And if we go back down here, we can align those values. Right? This value seen underneath the y is our b squared, that is 4. The value seen underneath our x is our a squared, that's the value is 16, which then does imply plus or minus a would be, or 4, plus or minus b would be 2, and c squared would be equal to a squared plus b squared, or 20, having the implication then that c, where our foci would be located, would be at plus or minus the root of 20, which is, again, somewhere between 4 and 5 in value. Right? This is a description of a hyperbola centered at the origin with a vertice at zero com or vertices at zero comma plus or minus two, determined by the four found underneath the y squared. That would be this location and this location in our graph, right? And foci at the coordinate zero comma plus or minus root twenty. Root twenty being a value between four and five, we see them as these locations in our graph. In terms of our oblique asymptotes, describing end behavior, they are given by the linear equation y equals plus or minus b over a. Now b is 2, a is 4, so this is technically 2 over 4, but that simplifies to 1 half in value. So these are lines that pass through our origin with slopes of plus or minus one half. And you will see that these graphs get very, very close to those lines as we head off towards plus or minus infinity in all directions. All right, so folks, this is again uh, looking at conic sections. The book does go a little further into conic sections where it gets into eccentricity and, and using eccentricity uh, to begin defining conic sections. But to be quite honest with you, as we move into Calc 3, we're going to deal very little with eccentricity. If you're in a physics class, you may want to study a little bit upon eccentricity and just note that um, 
We can also talk about these in the context of eccentricity. So you may see that develop in your studies somewhere down the line. Um, and then there is ways of defining these, uh, the cases for hyperbolas, parabolas, and ellipses, where we orientate the uh, one, or the foci, or at least one of the foci for the case of the ellipse and the hyperbola, at the origin in the system. And when we do that, we develop the conic sections in the context of what we would call Kepler's equations for motion in space, right? Uh, and what we can get are our descriptions of hyperbolic, um, parabolic, and elliptical uh, motion around a foci positioned at the origin in a system. And where this becomes uh, convenient is when we look at uh, really what we might consider celestial motion, motion that happens out there in what we, we understand as outer space, right? Uh, as, as planets and uh, comets and, and, and other things uh, move around uh, objects with larger, uh, what, pulls of gravity, they move in certain paths, those paths being elliptical, those paths being uh, parabolic, those paths being hyperbolic in behavior. And Kepler's laws and, and rules uh, come into apply there. So, you'll, you, you know, if you want to study your conic sections in the context of Kepler's, that is also uh, presented at the end of this section. But for what we're going to need up in Calc 3 uh, and, and what we're going to need for the end of the semester just to begin understanding some of our quadratic surfaces, is right here with these three definitions, right? Along with what we already understand in the context of circles and points and lines in space. All right, folks, and we're going to see common orientations. This is, again, the setups for some very common orientations. Um, but as with things like circles, we can notice, right, certainly circles can reorientate themselves in, in space, right? They can be shifted left and right so many units, which have a certain impact on their respective equations, right? So you can also consider, if these are the fundamental situations, there are more complex scenarios that might come up where we might consider changing, for instance, this x value. Ah, let me do it this way. Right, considering it with some uh, horizontal shifting and some what vertical shifting in the system. Now that might look a little bit more familiar to you in the context of um, what quadratic functions, or we might consider seeing something similar down here in the cases for an ellipse. What you will make note on an ellipse, an elliptical situation is really the case for, a, what, an unbalanced circle, all right? Uh, if a squared and b squared are equivalent to each other in a, an elliptical equation, you will have the equation for a circle, all right? So you would maybe see stuff similar to what would be happening in a circle where you could consider shifting these x and y values much like you shift the center of a circle, respectively. Right, where H and K might now represent the center of an ellipse, right? That is located at H comma K. This would be a respective description, right? Or we could see something similar even in the case of a hyperbola down below here, right? We might consider shifting Y, right? K units up or down, and we might consider shifting X h units left or right within their equations and we would see respective changes in our hyperbolic descriptions all right so realize these are the fundamentals folks but these fundamentals can be considered in more complex contexts right uh, some things that you're going to kind of need to study independently on your own right and should be part of your own independent study and, and, and maybe something you need to study just down in, at the line of future studies uh, but you now have some direction in that respect, right? So, folks, I hope you're hanging in there. I'll end the video here. We are getting a little long. I got to go back and double check some things on the video. But I think we're all good, and I'll see you next time.